Welcome to this new episode of Ask Stago, the podcast dedicated to provide expert answers to your expert questions in hemostasis. I am Ceci Roque and I'm so glad to be the co-host again today with Audrey Caro. In this episode, we already did two episodes about the routine testing with the PT and IPTT. It was then time to talk about the latest test of the coagulation routine panel, the fibrinogen. What is it for? What are the methods to quantify it? Our guests will help us to summarize all the basic things to know about this essay. And our expert guest today is Lydie Nikou. Lydie is an important member of the R&D team here at Stago as she is the R&D Design and Biological Applications Director. She already has participated to our podcast on the first season to explain us what is the assay sensitivity and assay specificity. But Lydie also has a long experience in the development of fibrinogen assays. So the perfect guest for today's podcast. Hello, Lydie. Hello, Cecile. Hello, Dre. Hello, everyone. Thanks for inviting me and happy to be with you again. So, Lily, as usual, we like to start with the base of the subject. What is a fibrinogen? As you mentioned, fibrinogen is a part of the general hemostasis screen, along with PT and APTT. Fibrinogen is produced by the liver and is important for blood clotting. It is a protein that helps stop bleeding and supports wound healing by forming clots at the site of bleeding wherever it is in your body. The test is also called Factor 1, Serum Fibrinogen, or Functional Fibrinogen Test. Lily, what is the clinical purpose of the dosage of a fibrinogen? Well, we can use it to investigate different clinical cases, such as investigation of unexpected abnormal coagulation test, such as hemorrhagic disorders, or diagnosis monitoring of DIC, establishment and monitoring of prolonged thrombolytic therapy, and risk assessment profiling for arterial disease. Hearing you, Lydie, we know now that there are fibrinogen disorders that are acquired and inherited, maybe. Yeah, in fact, it's true. We can live with an inherited disorders. For example, at fibrinogenemia, there is no production of fibrinogen. It's quite rare, and it will cause heavy bleeding. Hypofibrinogenemia, you have a reduced production of fibrinogen, less than one gram per liter. You are generally asymptomatic and dysfibrinogenemia, where the fibrinogen is defective. Here, the level is between, let's say, 1.5 to 3.5 grams per liter, and you can be asymptomatic or have bleeding or thrombosis. And what about the acquired pathologies then? Well, here you clearly have clinical effects. There is unfortunately plenty of source, but we can find different disorders such hyperfibrinogenemia caused by age, pregnancy, or inflammation. It is linked to a risk factor for VTE or cardiovascular disease. Hypofibrinogenemia caused by liver failure, thrombolytic therapy, or massive blood transfusion. And dysfibrinogenemia caused by liver disease. Our pockets are mainly dedicated to health professionals working with lab results. So, you may expect my next question. How to investigate on a defect of fibrinogen in a patient? So for this, there are two kinds of fibrinogen blood tests, what we call the activity tests. This test looks at how well your fibrinogen function by looking at how long it takes for blood to form a clot. If it takes too long, it could mean that your fibrinogen is not working well or that the levels are lower than they should be. And there's also the antigen test, and this test is used to measure the level of fibrinogen in your blood only. I would like to focus on the first type of test, the activity test, uh, because if I am right, this is the most commonly used. Yes, you're right. In this category of tests, you have what we call the close methods, and the close method is actually the reference method. In the presence of an excess of thrombin, the clotting time of a diluted plasma is directly related to the level of plasma fibrinogen. It's the most readable method for general use in clinical laboratories. And for our listeners that may be a bit lost, don't worry, you just have to remember. There, we measure a clotting time and refer to a calibration curve to refer to the fibrinogen concentration. That's a basic report between the level and the time. Thanks, Audrey. And Eddie, what are the level ranges expected? It circulates throughout the bloodstream in a concentration of 
two to four gram per liter in general, and it's by far the highest concentration of any blood clotting factor. And for some of our data, you may be more used to a different unit, actually, the milligram per deciliter. Just multiply the value by 100 and you will get the value that you are used to. Uh, Lydie, can we have a variation depending on the geographical region? Yes, sometimes it may vary for adults between two to four gram per liter. Sometimes it's considered slightly wider. But as usual, your doctor will interpret your fibrinogen test, taking into account your clinical background, your symptoms, your medical history, and other results. And as usual, each lab should determine its normal range. And so what are the really pathological levels? Well, the majority of the pathologies are linked to an increase of the fibrinogen level. You could observe an increase of the level of fibrinogen up to 7 grams per liter and sometimes even more. And it's linked to inflammatory syndrome of numerous diseases, diabetes, obesity, cancer, HIV, etc., etc. Except for one population where the increase is expected and it's always the same. I'm talking, of course, about the pregnant woman. <laughs> Yes, you're right. And on the other hand, hypofibrinogenemia is not as common and it's linked to a drastic decrease of the level of fibrinogen. You could be around 0.5 gram per liter. Whoa, very, very low. Um, Lily, you mentioned that the closed method is the gold standard, actually, and it's the quantitative determination of fibrinogen level that exists since 1957, I think. But it is also very important to mention that the method for clot detection is also very important. Actually, the fibrinogen assay has the specificity to create a clot called weak clot. And all it's in the name, weak clot. It means that we create a clot less strong than the one creating during PT or APTT assay. And the mechanical detection is more sensitive to the creation of that weak clot, leading to an early detection of the clot compared to optical measurement. We also know that the optical detection is affected by HIN interferences for the test of the fibrinogen. In fact, we did a full podcast on the HIN interferences. Thanks for the reminder, <laughs> Lily. So Lily, when I started as Tygo, I had some struggle to understand the utility of two other tests that are linked to fibrinogen, the thrombin time and the reptilus time. Uh, can you help our auditor to clarify these points? Well, when you perform PT, APTT, or FIP test, you basically measure how long it takes your blood to clot. Abnormally long times indicate a problem in the clot formation, such as low levels of functional fibrinogen. But they, we have also some fibrinogen-specific clotting tests, like the thrombin time and the reptilase time. So let's start with the thrombin time. So the thrombin time is a test designed for the assessment of fibrin formation. It measures the time it takes fibrinogen to be converted into fibrin by adding thrombin. And in the presence of a predetermined quantity of thrombin, a normal plasma will cut in a constant time. So the thrombin time is sensitive to mild fib deficiency and dysfunction, but it's also affected by other factors that inhibit thrombin. So it may also be performed as a screening test of a complement of PT. And APTT. So if I summarize, it is a test where we look at the time and we're like a kind of cutoff, like a sample and easy test, but it is not precise in terms of quantity. You're right. As we have no calibration, it is less standardized than the cloud methods and numerous countries are not using thrombin time anymore. And in many areas, indeed, the thrombin time has been abandoned due to its poor sensitivity through the years to assess the fibrinogen level of functional effect. But it has proven to be useful to detect direct thrombin inhibitors such as the dabigatron in the patient sample. And I know that sometimes in some areas it's used in the pre-analytical workup, actually. Ah, oh, okay. Thank you, Audrey. And um, what about the reptilus? Well, the reptilus time measures the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin, like we described previously, but using snake venom instead of thrombin. It is, therefore, as sensitive as the thrombin time test, but it's not affected by medication, like, for example, heparin treatment. So, therefore, some laboratories are using it in comparison with the thrombin time to detect heparin contamination in the blood sample. 
And here, the term contamination is probably important because it is linked to a real contamination during the blood collection, preparation, or because the patient has taken heparin, as you were saying. And it is not a test to measure the level of uh, those drugs in the blood or the plasma sample. Ah, it is now really clear. I hope that I had this podcast when I arrived at Stego. <laughs> so it is time to finish uh, our episode of the day, Lidi. Any last recommendation for our auditors? Well, concerning fibrinogen tests, uh, the recommendation is close method is definitely the reference method for that assessment. And let's say the general usual recommendation, always follow the IFU of your test setup carefully. Well, ladies, it is now time to close this episode. Thanks so much, Lily, for this precious information. Thank you all for listening. As usual, all literature sources are listed in the podcast description. You can follow us on LinkedIn and on Twitter or subscribe to Ask Stago Podcast channel on your favorite platform. And please feel free to send us any question that you may have at our email address, ask at stago.com. We will be glad to answer it in the next episode. See you next time. This podcast is brought to you by Stago. Diagnostics is in our blood.